As soon as videotape left the factory, it already started to break down. Information that is on the tapes is slowly dying, and if we don't preserve them, important historical content that's contained on them will be lost forever. What is MePOPS? What is MePOPS? What is MePOPS? MePOPS stands for Moving Image Preservation of Puget Sound. What MePOPS does for the general public of the Pacific Northwest is provide access to digitized content. Our mission is to raise awareness about the magnetic media crisis, the alarm that the Association of Moving Image Archivists sounded to sort of bring awareness to the urgency of digitizing videotape. Audiovisual Archive in Australia has put a deadline of 2025 to say if you don't have your magnetic material digitized by this time, you're, you're screwed. They're figuring out the actual date and it's right around the corner. Within 20 to 30 years of the time it's created, it's, it's disintegrating. The magnetic media crisis is sometimes called a gathering storm because the deterioration of the actual analog videotapes and then the increasing obsolescence and rarity of the players that play them back. So video is a little bit different from film in that video went through all these different iterations, all these different formats for consumer purposes, for broadcast purposes, whereas film, there were consumer formats, 616 millimeter, 8, 8 millimeter, but the principle of film has stayed pretty consistent and video requires all these different players. A lot of the formats that we work with stopped being manufactured years ago. And so we have to make sure that we take good care of them and tune them up, clean them, because a lot of the parts and players are getting harder and harder to come by, and so are the people who actually work on them. They're a dying breed, if you will. In some cases, people thought they were creating preservation copies by putting um, film onto videotape. In fact, that was that was not a great a great a great idea. Film is actually quite stable. The thing about older media types like film and negatives is that they are stable. Thirty years from now, you're going to be able to view them. Hundred year old nitrate film, in some cases, is still around and looks gorgeous. Rosie Video, for its manufacture, had a completely different different purpose. It was more of a kind of uh, democratizing um, format for shooting. It was a lot cheaper than film, so not only were professionals using it, but also amateurs and just the average person was able to buy videotape and record. There was plenty of access. You could watch your, your VHS tape of a film, but now that VHS tape needs a lot of help. We have to keep up. We can't just sort of settle back and say, okay, we're finished. Despite the fact that we're working with old materials that have their fixed content, the way we view that material, the way we store that material is going to just keep changing and evolving. A lot of the time, videotape is capturing real people doing real things. That might sound personal and boring, but it really encompasses so much of Seattle and Seattle's history that it's valuable to the general public and great for them to be able to access it. The public is able to see files digitized at MePOPS on Internet Archive where we create collections for each group so that they can, based on that institution, go in and view the content on their personal computer. of Virtual Moving History, a production of Moving Image Preservation of Puget Sound in association with Northwest Film Forum, is an exploration of local television news as seen through archival footage from regional libraries, museums, and archives. My name is Hannah Palin. I am the Moving Image Curator at the University of Washington Library's Special Collections. News has been called the first rough draft of history. It is the way that we record events, big and small, and ensure that we have an informed body politic. It's immediate, unrefined, and a necessity for capturing day-to-day -day events that make up our communal experience. So initially, 16 millimeter was the chosen format for news gathering. 
But sometime in the 1970s, when with the advent of videotape, a lot of television stations switched from film to videotape because it was easier and less expensive. The problem was that in the process of making that transition, they threw out their entire 16 millimeter film libraries, and I mean threw them out into the dumpster, discarded, gone by. Then, with the advent of digital news gathering, we're undergoing the same event where videotape libraries are also being discarded, thrown away, and lost forever. So Cairo Television News is a local CBS affiliate here in Seattle, and in the course of making that transition from videotape to digital, they called me and said, would you like to have our videotape library? And I was like, yes, please. May I? I would love that. Because I'd always felt that that was a hole in our moving image collections. So I went ahead and said yes, please, to 15,000 plus videotapes ranging from 1975 to 2006 with some more besides, um, and brought in a collection of daily news broadcasts, logs, special programming, sports, and raw footage, air checks. Air checks are the things that you see it's as the public would have seen the actual broadcast with the news anchors saying, back to you, Bob. So I decided to adopt all of that. It took us over a year to bring those 15,000 tapes in one van load at a time to our storage facility in, here in Seattle. But we've got it, and we're slowly chipping away one little bit of a at a time to arrange and describe and provide access to research and researchers and to the public. It's taken a bit, but we're getting there. So what you're going to see tonight, the first program, uh, is from the UW Library Special Collections, and it is a program called On Cue. It was a daily broadcast, and this particular piece was aired on the first year anniversary of Cairo um, going on the air. So this was in February 1959. The thing to know about this is that it was originally shot on 16 millimeter film, and we didn't get this from Cairo. I found it in a completely different collection because Cairo was one of the stations that threw away their original footage. Um, but because we had this one and because it was 16 millimeter, I found some money in a corner and I ran to our best local film lab and I said, please like press, make it beautiful. And they did. And it's gorgeous. So what you're going to see is exactly how reporters and cameramen reported the news in 1959. And it's rare. It's super unique. I d haven't seen it anywhere else. It's definitely nowhere else in our archives. And I'm thrilled to be able to present it to you. Um, I feel that local television news, aside from all the other fabulous archival footage that we have in our collections, but it is truly part of history and deserves to be preserved. We've got some other collections of um, KSTW in Tacoma. We have uh, a little bit of King. Some of their um, retired producers gave us some material. So we're slowly building an archive of local television news. And I think it is imperative that we, as a region, preserve this for the future. So if you feel like supporting your local archive, library, museum, cinematech, please, in these troubled times, please do so, so that we can continue to preserve this amazing material and present it to the public for generations to come. And now, back to you, Bob. On cue each day, the events, the laughter, the tragedies of the world come into your living room. Your only requirement, the flip of a switch. 
Ours, the digging for, the editing, and the presentation of that valuable and fleeting commodity of modern society, news. Hello, this is Sam Rineker for the National Bank of Commerce, reporting on the business of news. This is a behind-the-scenes look, a look at the who, what, where, why, when, and how of it. Who makes news? The people you know, multiplied by the people they know, multiplied by the people everyone's heard of, and on to infinity. The task of your Cairo Television News Bureau, simply to report the doings of people. As everyone has, a news department has basic tools, a pad and a pencil, and a 16 millimeter movie camera. With these implements, the Cairo News staff produces the three news shows you expect to see in your home each day. News can start anywhere, in the complaint bureau at police headquarters. Then out over police radio. Or perhaps from a housewife's phone call about a feature story. or, as happens frequently, in a publicity agent's cluttered den. At midday, 6.30 and 10 p.m. each weekday, you see the finished product of Channel 7's news gathering like this. A fire, a statement from a Senate Rackets Committee investigator, and a trip underground highlighted today's news. But behind each news program of this sort is a day's work, hard work. To start at the beginning, at the beginning of a working day, let's go into the Channel 7 newsroom. There are schedules to be maintained and appointments to be kept. The dawn does not merely bring a new day to the news department, it brings a commitment to check out last night's leftovers and warm up what may have been yesterday's big story. Already a pre-dawn fire has started the day. The press conferences are lined up and assignments are made for the day. Each reporter is his own writer, copy reader, and editor, plus his own idea man. Each cameraman is his own porter, sound technician, and imaginative director. But there are aids to news gathering, the familiar teletype machine, and the miracle of modern communications, the United Press International Unifax machine, which spews out an endless parade of still pictures from all points of the world. Electric impulses flash on sensitized paper, and in minutes, there's a picture. At this point, it's known that certain stories will be ready for the news programs, and others are planned. One news team leaves the building, headed for a press conference. But like the rest of the staff, they're always anticipating the unexpected. This is KD8033. A police car just went whistling by here north on Queen Anne Avenue. Anything up? Uh, no, Chuck, it's not newsworthy. It was just a police call for a heart attack case. A uh, fire department resuscitator and ambulance are on the way. Right. Well, we'll continue on then to the Kennedy press conference. This is Katie, 8033, over and out. And on they go, collecting the routine news for the day. But what's routine to a news team may not be so matter-of-fact to a viewer, accustomed only to watching the polished newscast. Let's follow. The driver is Tom Carson, chief cameraman. He's skilled in the use of a variety of movie equipment. And movie equipment is the eye which brings news into focus in your home. The reporter is Chuck Dunsire. His responsibility, to be on top of the news, to know the intricacies of government, to have a feeling about the interesting, and to understand the depths of emotion. As you watch our news programs at home, you see each story in capsule form with the essence of the information. We have to tell you the whole story in carefully timed seconds. 
Behind the minute or two devoted to each item are hours devoted to gathering, processing, and editing. Once going, as you can see, the press conference is no hit and run operation. There's the competition of other TV stations, of radio, and the daily newspapers. From all this confusion, there must come intelligent reporting, and above all, it must be new. Questions never before raised and comments never before heard. Here's a face which should be familiar, Robert F. Kennedy, the younger brother of Senator John Kennedy and former chief counsel for the Senate Select Committee on Improper Activities in the Labor or Management Fields, or, as you came to know it through your newsmen, the Senate Rackets Committee. If as one crew is hard at work on their assignment, another is busy wrapping up a story. As I mentioned before, the unexpected is always just around the corner, and Channel 7 is geared for it. The ears of everyone are subconsciously tuned, waiting for the urgent voice which brings the first flash of disaster. At a minute's notice, a seaplane is standing by to carry a crew anywhere the day's news may be breaking in the Pacific Northwest. This crew, reporter Hank Landine and cameraman Malon Brousseau, has been out early on a fire story, and now they are stopping at the film laboratory. As each coverage is completed, the story is in two parts half in the film, and the other half on notes crammed into the reporter's pockets. Getting the film ready is a mechanical process. In the film lab, technicians always have room for another roll of film. The lab is geared to develop huge amounts of film each day. Primarily for news work, scenes are shot on 16 millimeter reversal film in 100 foot rolls. The exposed film is delivered, then it's into inky blackness. Processing instructions require that film be run through the soup in the dark, but here's a lighted demonstration. First, the tail end of the exposed roll is spooled onto a big reel. Then onto the developing machine. It's attached to a continuous belt leader which runs through the developing bath. The processing starts through the first developer, the rinse, the bleach, and the clearing bath. Then reversal film is re-exposed to make the images appear positive rather than negative. It's developed again, then fixed to halt developing action. Finally, it's washed and dried. Perfect exposure, perfect development. Ready for the air, almost. This part is done. The film is picked up for delivery back to the newsroom. Meantime, another assignment is being undertaken. Seattle's repair job on the North Trunk sewer, which collapsed into the big Ravenna hole and made national headlines several years ago, has been completed. The civic dignitaries are there for a tour, and so is the press, including Channel 7's Keith Craig. Down they go, and pity the equipment-laden cameraman. They walk the length of the tunnel. Whoops, watch the head, Mayor. It's the cameraman who has to weasel and squirm to get in the right places so that he can show you what went on. A workout like this is a hop, skip, and jump to an agile cameraman. Downtown, a daily feature of Channel 7 News is being filmed, Man on the Street. Reporter Ron Forcell picks out a timely question each day, then inquires of the public for down-to-earth comments. People we have found like to be heard most of the time. There are some who back out at the last second. Back in the newsroom, it's been a race all day, and now it's getting close to the final wire. The film is ready, the reporter knows the scenes which have been shot. And his is the chore of grinding out a word story to match the film story, a chore which sometimes is not as easy as it looks. The films are mounted on a projector, 
and preview to find the best scene. It's with stories like these you've been shown and others found during the working day, a 24-hour working day, that the daily television news program is born. The facts are weaned in the typewriter and they grow to full size with generous editions of film. After everything has been timed, the next job is the film editors. Back and forth through the reel he goes, looking for the scenes that help spin the yarn. It's done, and it goes into a rack, waiting to be built into the final reel for the show. In this newsroom, nearly 1,500 feet of film are exposed every day. Compare that to the amateur movie cameraman who may expose 100 feet a year. Of course, for news work, only the best is finally used. In addition to the local film coverage, more hundreds of feet of processed film arrive each day from United Press Movie Tone bringing national and international stories of importance into direct contact with the viewing audience. It's getting close now, and time is a bigger factor than ever. In 48 minutes, the 6.30 news report must go on the air. But already, the 10 p.m. report is being roughed up. Don Riley will use later breaking news to change the format of that program, yet it will have the main stories from the earlier show. Nearly everything is ready. And as do the newscasters for the other news shows, I take my place in the studio. Downstairs, the individual stories are put together in film sequence by film editor Don Platt. And the big reel goes into the master control room, where it's placed on the television scanner, a complicated piece of electronic equipment which transfers the images on movie film into television signals. All is ready, the director has a copy of the script, and he knows when to roll the film. At his command, the button is pressed, the film rolls, and you see and hear the news in man's most modern, his most incisive, and his most factual means of communication. So there it is, a brief look at a fascinating business. Next time you tune in, you'll know a little bit more about what television does to keep you up to date. And you'll get your news on cue on Channel 7. So long. officially opening the Thousand Cranes exhibit. On hand were Seattle Council Member Dolores Sabanga, the Japanese Consul General, and the Museum Board President, Mrs. Virginia Wright. Also participating was a group of Japanese children who performed a traditional dance. Here's a look at that ceremony. <laughs> I'm Ginny Wright. I'm president of the Board of Trustees of the Seattle Art Museum, and I'm very glad to welcome you here tonight for this beautiful exhibition of Japanese art. It's wonderful to think that every object in our exhibition belongs to us, the Seattle Art Museum. Uh, it's been, uh, as part of our permanent collection, it's been lovingly, all the objects have been lovingly and thoughtfully collected over the 50-year period of the museum's existence. Thank you. 
It's an example to me of the reason that the city of Seattle joined with the Seattle Art Museum and the citizens of the city and private business to welcome the new downtown location of the museum. There you will be able to see even more of the extensive exhibit of Oriental art that the Seattle Art Museum has had in the dark for so long. And won't that be a great contribution for the entire region to be able to, at this time, be able to see that wonderful exhibit. Now that these visitors have had a chance to take in some of this exhibit of Japanese art, here are some of their impressions. I'm glad the Seattle Art Museum got it out of the stacks and got it all together. I just the pots. I'm a potter, so the pots are just truly amazing, just beautiful. He likes the uh, the birds on the scrolls. That's his favorite, and I think I prefer. Well, I don't know. I like all of it. I like the pottery, the masks, and uh, the the uh, the brushwork. Oh, I I just think it's wonderful. I I have such uh, wonderful memories when I was growing up near the art museum, and so as I go around and, and look at all these wonderful treasures, it brings back not only memories but um, a real thrill to just seeing all these wonderful pieces. I'm going to Japan soon, so it's uh, it's a really nice. It's good for you. Yeah. I think it's exceptionally lovely and very informative. It's something that I hadn't uh, hadn't uh, had not expected. Uh, the era before Christ. They've got a several article here that applies BC. I found it very fascinating. I collect some of the antiques, Oriental antiques, both Chinese and Japanese, and so it means a little more to me to see things that are even older than what I've collected. I think it's 200 years old. Yeah, that's a Chinese jade carving that she's wearing there. Oh, yeah. Yes, but that's all right. I've enjoyed this part. Light. She likes the light camera and action. Yeah. We are babies that are failed. So, George came. Although I'm not Japanese, I have a great affinity for art being Chinese. And I think it's just a wonderful collection. Oh, it's wonderful. All of these old friends from the Japanese gallery are in a different light. And nice to see so many people here. We wanted to come. I think Chinese stuff is neat. <laughs> if you want to take in the Thousand Cranes exhibition on your own, you've got plenty of time. The show will run for five months. That's during mid-July here at the Seattle Art Museum Pavilion at Seattle Center. That's our show for this evening. Tomorrow, Barry Mitzman will be in the studio with his panel of local journalists for Night Sight Week and Review. And on Monday, Leela and I will be back with a show on how changes in immigration law will affect many of us. The new law will make it illegal for employers to hire undocumented workers. And it will require all American workers to carry proof of citizenship. Also on Monday, Paul Dorpat takes us back in time to around the turn of the century for a glimpse of Seattle through a collection of rare old photographs. Please join us. See you Monday. Good night. Welcome back everyone to the Museum of Flight. When we heard that there was a descendant of Chief Seattle living in Port Orchard, we wanted to talk to her. We wanted to find out if she knew stories about the Chief that we hadn't heard yet. If she had any fond memories of the family. What we found was a woman who was ashamed of her past until something changed her mind. Mary Lou Slaughter is the great, 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 great granddaughter of Chief Seattle. As she digs for the cedar roots that she weaves into baskets, she connects with her own as well. Yeah, it's a lot of work. 
everything that worth, worthwhile is work, don't you think? Mary Lou has struggled with her past for years. She remembers the day her second grade teacher announced to the kids that one of their classmates was related to Chief Seattle. You know, I thought, well, that's kind of neat. You know, they, they think that's special. And so, but then on the way home from school, the kids chased me and they did war whoops. You know, that um, thing. <laughs> and uh, called me nasty, dirty old Indian and all kinds of names, and I just would cringe inside. After that, Mary wanted nothing to do with her Duwamish Indian heritage. I come home from school and I told my mom, I said, I'm not Indian like you, I'm Swede like my dad. <laughs> and she said, well, you didn't get those big brown eyes from your Swedish father. After 50 years of avoiding her ancestry, Mary found something on an Alaskan beach that changed her mind an eagle feather. And I reached down to pick it up, and I, when I picked it up, it was like I had this warm bolt of heat went up my arm. And it actually put tears in my eyes. I just was overwhelmed. It chokes me up to talk about it. But um, and it was like God telling me, Mary, it's OK that you're Indian. And it was a, like the first time in my life I really felt good about it. After that experience, Mary took an Indian name, the same one her great-grandmother had, Slada, which means lady. She also discovered a skill she shared with another ancestor. I understand myself better now because I know where my talents come from. And because uh, Princess Angeline was a basket weaver. Princess Angeline was Chief Seattle's daughter, Mary's great-great-great-grandmother. Mary has unraveled most of her family's history on her own. She doesn't have much to go on. There's only one known photograph of Chief Seattle. You know, I've done some research and found out that he was almost six feet tall, that he was a very large Indian. Um, he had curly hair, which is unusual. Weaving together her own story has been as difficult and time-consuming as making her baskets. I have people tell me I have lots of patience. This basket will take 200 hours to finish, but when you think about the lineage Mary's basket represents, 200 hours doesn't seem like much time. I would like to pass my knowledge and on to keep it going, because I think our tribe is dying because of the uh, people not interested. And I wish I could do more. Mary Lou's hands link the past to the future and her baskets are full of hope. Maybe someday I can teach my grandchildren how to weave baskets. I would love that. Mary Lou is very attached to uh, everything that she makes, but occasionally she will sell a piece or two. If you'd like to get in touch with her, we'll put her uh, phone number on the hotline for you. There is a new movie that's coming out. I'd love to tell you all about it, but I can't. I'll explain why. Ooh. This sore neck girl is ruining my life changing my whole personality. I'll tell you about the movie right after this. <laughs> Yes, this is really an airplane, a Casper Wing ultralight to be exact, and it is flying inside the kingdom. This plane and another like it will race during the halftime show of the Paper Airplane Championships this coming Sunday. The promoter, Michael Campbell, apparently feels he has to outdo himself at the halftime show every year. In previous championships, hang gliders and parachutists have leapt to the kingdom stadium floor. One would think an airplane race wouldn't be the safest event to stage. Tens of thousands of people are expected to show up for the contest. Campbell has the event loaded with insurance. Yeah, it's pretty dangerous, and I think it's the first time a aircraft has ever flown inside a building with a human being inside, inside the plane, so we'll have to wait and see. The pilot who did the demonstration flight for reporters today is the co-inventor of the hang glider turned airplane. He says, aside from being careful not to hit the speakers hung from the ceiling, the only other thing to worry about is turbulence. 
How do you get turbulence inside the Kingo? Your own turbulence. You leave it behind every time you go around one time. It leaves a little bit of turbulence behind. So you, every time you go around, you hit it in the same spot. It's always in the, spot, in the same spot every time. So you, you want to keep constantly changing your flight uh, path so that you avoid the turbulence left behind in the first lap. Despite the way it looks, Steve says it isn't so much dangerous as tricky. And he says it gets safer the more practice one has. He points out, though, that by the time race day rolls around on Sunday, he'll have more practice than his opponent, Gary Wilson, will have. In the Kingdom, Roger Gadley for the 10 o'clock news. ahead for you in the news this Thursday. The lore of the Skagit Indian tribe. Hear and see for yourself the tale of ogres and hunchbacks and why children should never go out after dark. Another Washington legend. What is better this night before All Hallows Eve than sitting by the flickering light of a fire, chills running up your spine as you listen to scary stories of things that go bump in the night? Well, that's our next story, one that's been passed down through generations of Skagit Indian children, a tale told by Skagit elder Vi Hilbert, with a little help from our own Bob Thronson. The language is ancient. So, too, is the legend it speaks. The basket ogres was a huge, fierce woman who uh, was out there to eat children if they played outdoors after dark. It is the story of the ogress and of Kikwich, the little hunchback. He is left to watch the tribe's children, but they are mean to him, and he calls to the basket ogress to punish them. She heard him and came running down through the woods picked up all the children, put them in her basket, which was made of snakes, all woven together. And she took them back to her home in the woods. She builds a fire to roast the Indian children and dances and sings in grisly triumph around the flames. She said, what are you saying, children? Oh, we're just saying what a wonderful voice you have, basket ogres. You sing so beautifully, sing some more. The children put their heads together and pushed her onto the hot rocks and pressed her down onto the fire. The ogress is dead, but Skagit legend says her children survive, that ogres still haunt the world, that little children must not play outside after dark. <laughs> Tomorrow for you, Halloween night. And on Nightcast, Bob tells the tale of the ghost who still prowls one of Seattle's most famous landmarks. extraordinary woman. She's been an activist all her life, having worked in the civil rights and the Native American movement, as well as environmental causes. She's also on the board of the Seattle Audubon Society, which gave Hazel a big party this year to thank her for her years of help. And when she's not organizing, Hazel likes to birdwatch, hike, kayak, or go camping. By the way, did I mention that she's 100 years old? Take a look. Hazel Wolf, and uh, I'm an environmentalist and have been since the early 60s. Hazel Wolf is, uh, is a character. 
and she's a person who really makes a difference. Hazel um, has been involved in the Audubon Society for 35 years. She has been the person most instrumental in organizing 21 of the 26 chapters in the state of Washington, and I don't think probably anybody else has a record like that. At 100 years old, you would think maybe a person would be running on a little steam, but Hazel is not. Hazel is just going every day. At least once a year I go camping, and I'll go this year looking at birds, looking at wildflowers, occasional rattlesnake, everybody screams. One of uh, Hazel's interesting stories is how she got involved with the environmental side of things. She had Seattle Audubon friends who wanted to get her out bird watching. And she was not particularly interested, but they pounded her and got her to go along. There was one bird that really appealed to her, the brown creeper. All day long, this little bird picked his food up from the bark. And um, I thought, this little bird works hard for, li for a living. I worked like, it, like the bird did, hard for a living. So I began to relate to that bird, felt very close to it. And then I recalled that Audubon, their mission, part of their mission is the protection of birds. I think that I was kind of open to that sort of thing because of my early life. I left school when I was in the eighth grade. Um, you know, my mother was very poor. We were very poor. My father died when I was pretty young. And she had three of us to, to support with very little education. She worked in overall factories. She belonged to the IWW. She went to union meetings. I went with her. When Hazel turned 100 years old, we couldn't resist having a big bash. It started with a big birthday celebration. And then Hazel thought, let's do something with it. And it was her idea to say, let's, let's set up an endowment. Do you think we could do that? Just a party wouldn't be good enough. <laughs> We're now in the process of setting up a whole program for junior Audubon clubs, and it's, it's focused on uh, pre-teenagers, you know, 10, 11, or 12 years old. And the children learn things that they don't forget, especially when it has to do concerning nature. They don't ever change their minds. I get lots of requests from schools. They ask interesting questions like, do I still have my own teeth? <laughs> And do I have a boyfriend? Children often ask me how it feels to be old. And I'll say, well, I feel like Hazel. I've always feel like Hazel. Oh, she is wonderful, isn't she? What a great lady. She's she a, could use some pretty jewelry. She certainly, I don't know, when she's bird watching and uh, guy yakking. And, I don't know, but I sure could use some. American Indian Heritage School is that all our relatives can and will learn. It's based on the Indian philosophy that we are all related, as well as animals, the trees, and the grass. That is our vision that everyone will and can learn. Our dropout percentage is a lot more than what the district's is. The district has uh, been anywhere from 56%, depending on what study you look at, down to uh, 36%. So ours is around 18 to 20 percent. The um, emphasis that we have here is that the students graduate and go on to college. We've been able to, in the last two years, uh, graduate 14 and 14 went on to college, graduated the year before 10 and 10 went on to college. So for the last two years we've been shooting 100 percent with uh, students going on to college. The school was um, developed in 1974. Our mission is to empower each student to become self-directed learners, interactive learners, preparing them for citizenship, healthy relationships, and academic as well as vocational and professional success. We work hard to preserve our American Indian heritage culture here by involving our parents and the elders and focusing our program on uh, preservation of um, the 
Indian culture and respect for and celebration of the traditions of our diverse Native American community. The process for schooling is one in which uh, we are t preparing them for the world of work, and that's our whole, whole emphasis here. The um, computers are something that uh, we've been able to really work with the school district on, and we have a great uh, computer lab. There's a number of things that the kids can do if they so choose, everything from beadwork to drawing, charcoal drawing. It is, again, individualized to the point where the kids can once they've got the basics down, they can go to work on whatever they'd like to work on. Physical education is um, one of the um, major parts of what we call the circle of life and the medicine wheel. The physical aspect is one that we emphasize that the kids continue throughout their life. Basketball, running, weightlifting, paddle ball, some of the favorites that the kids enjoy getting into or what we tell kids to think about doing for the rest of their lives because it's something that we've got to keep in our life in order to stay physically fit. The basketball teams that we have are in the middle school level as well as the high school level. And we participate in the SeaTac B League, one of the small schools, and we compete against all the private schools in this area. The game of basketball is one in which it was invented by the American Indians, and so it's a traditional sport. You know, we consider it a traditional sport as well as running, and we have cross country in the fall and uh, track and field in the, in the winter. And throughout um, the year, we have our dance group that uh, does performances. Oh my God, we've gone as far as California, as, as well as Oregon and Idaho. So it's one in which we get out and travel with uh, the teams, and we take them to a lot of different places that um, are educational. And they're fun, but educational. about how you all got started. Where did you meet? Well, it's a somewhat convoluted story, but basically we met um, at a mine workshop school in a little town called South Paris, Maine, on the East Coast. That's run by a really fine teacher named Tony Montanaro. And the three of us were at the workshop. Um, and then we sort of split up for a while. We, were, we didn't have an intention immediately to form a company, but in 1977, we were together in Seattle and, and formed the Seattle Mind Theater there. So we had that common background. And Elizabeth, this was uh, when that you formed the company? 1977. 1977. So you all have been working together for quite a while. It's now. been quite a yeah. It's been Long time. seven yeah. and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> Longer than a lot of companies are size. That's really my my intention of saying that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, That's very unusual, actually. Most. Uh, Theater companies, dance companies, mime companies have a real rotation of personnel. Sometimes there might be one person who is sort of holding things together for years with a lot of other people working with that person. But we just, uh, we are unique, I think. I've never heard of another company that's holding well, that's, this long. That's one of the differences between our company and many other companies. That is to say that most companies, I would say, have an artistic director who holds everything together and makes the decisions. Whereas in the Seattle Mind Theater, we're all um, individuals and equals. There's no artistic director. We work cooperatively and make cooperative decisions for the most part. So you're interacting a little bit more like a family than you are as individuals. And, That's uh, true. How are you growing as far as uh, your artistic abilities Oh, I go? think our material has changed tremendously um, over the last eight years, although there are still some things we do that we love and work so well. Um, they're still in our repertory. but. Uh, we take more risks now with some of our material, and we've really, I think, evolved in many ways. It's, uh, it's, it's one of the most difficult things we have to do is to describe what we do, because almost every, every piece that we do is so different from every other one that it's difficult to categorize them or describe them in, in a generalization. To make one comment on <clears throat> our evolution, when we first started performing, we did wear uh, a traditional uh, white face makeup, and we were primarily a silent performing company. And I think that's the popular view uh, of mine in the United States now, as 
uh, put out there by Marcel Marceau, who kind of regenerated interest in mime in the, in the United States. But as time went by, we felt somewhat restricted by the white face in that it was so strongly a silent medium that we discarded it and started making sounds and started speaking. And much of our work uh, uses sounds and some of our work uh, really amounts to plays. We have three children's fairy tales, for example, that we have toured in the past, uh, Pinocchio, Jack and the Beanstalk, and Cinderella. And they are one hour long, and they make use of masks and dialogue and props and costumes. I would love to perform for us this morning. Would you mind doing something? No. no. <laughs> I thought you said that. <laughs> Good. I think the first thing we can do here is have Bruce demonstrate some of the technique that the Seattle Mime Theater can perform. As you can see, he's creating some flat wall surface. That is pushing. Bruce is a master pusher. So whether it be a clothes washer filled with wet clothes or a piano. His mind technique can allow us to really see the strain and weight of that object. And what I'm going to do now is turn the mic over to Bruce and have him take it from there. Right. Let's have uh, Rick and Elizabeth out here. We've been in the schools all week, and one of the things that's been most popular that the children have seen is what we call a shape character. And the two of them stand very neutrally at first. And then we'd have several kids come up, four children would come up on stage and would shape Rick and Liz just as if they were clay sculptures. They'd move their heads and they'd make their faces in different shapes any way they want to shape them. And they would just laugh hysterically as their classmates would be doing odd things with their limbs and torsos. And then they would finish, and then the children would sit down in the audience, and then the two sculptors would then come alive and start to improvise on the shapes they were given and create a little scene for the kids. We'll just start a little bit of that here right now. So the children would have a chance to improvise as artists, and then the actors would improvise on those shapes. And sometimes they'd be creatures, or sometimes they'd be more human, sometimes less. And we'd never know what was going to happen. It's very exciting. And sometimes we go out into the audience as these creatures and uh, involve the children in what was happening. And so that was uh, an example of the uh, very physical visual theater that the Seattle Mime Theater does. Um, and that's the demonstration that we had planned for you this morning.
There's a new don't ask, don't tell policy being shopped around City Hall. Councilmember Nick Licata wants to bar Seattle police from inquiring into someone's immigration status. Since the September 2001 terrorist attacks, Licata says many illegal immigrants have fear being deported if they call the police to report crimes or even if they just sign up for various city services. Licata's legislation would allow questioning of immigration status only if there is reasonable suspicion that the person has committed a felony also. Why the fuss? Well, Licata says that immigration violations typically are handled by the federal government and should not be dealt with by local police who have enough concerns as it is. It has actually been the policy of the police department not to ask about immigration status unless there were other concerns. The purpose of Licata's ordinance is to codify that practice into law and to make it clear what the city's policy is. Some officers, though, say such a law will impair their ability to fight crime. The monorail board met this week, the first time since the election was certified. Their main item of business formally accepted the, accepting rather, the plan approved by voters. Supporters showed up to urge such adoption. It was hardly necessary, but it does show their post-election enthusiasm. Monorail director Joel Horn also announced that just over a month into the project, they are still on time and even under budget. To start the executive director's report by letting people know that if we can open the green line on December 15th in 2007, remember we want to open the first segment in 2007, that would be a Saturday, and it would be 1,826 days from today. That's 1,826 days from today, or five years from yesterday. But who's counting, right? As is typical of late, there was some talk about City Light at City Hall this week. Heidi Wills introduced legislation to begin a risk management study. She was met with at least some skepticism from colleague Judy Nicastro, who wondered aloud about how all the City Light studies, audits, reviews, oversights, and committees are going to be connected and related. We seem to be discussing a bunch of um, ways to better be educated and manage the utility, and I'm not clear on where they're all sort of heading to in this respect of here we are, here this would hire a consultant to look at risk management. There's also been talk about um, the mayor setting up a task force which people would be paid $500 to give us advice, to give him advice, to give us advice. I'm not clear on what that task force would do yet. That doesn't seem to be fully hashed out. And the third element is the council, we've discussed from the audit report, an oversight committee, utility oversight uh, body, and I don't know where that's at either. So I'm seeing a lot of sort of stuff going on, don't have the big picture. And it's approximately $500,000, which represents less than one half of 1% of Seattle City Light's budget. And I would say that those are dollars well spent because the fact that we don't have adequate risk management policies in place means that we stand to lose much more dollars. And perhaps, and this came forward in the Vantage Consulting Audit, if we had had robust risk management policies in place, you know, hindsight's 2020. but it, looking back, would we have been as exposed to the market as we had? Would we be in debt to the extent that we are? So I think that these are dollars well spent, well spent as we're looking forward, particularly in the fact that we are cash strapped and we cannot afford any further debt. But not before we talk about parking. A new city report offers recommendations about how Seattle can better manage parked cars. One pilot proposal to be launched shortly will include parking meters that accept credit cards. That one I love. No more mounds of change to lug around. If you had your children's undivided attention 22 hours a week, what would you teach them? How to read and write? That animals are friends? How to get along with other children? That too much sugar can be bad for your teeth? That it's wrong to kill another person? We are Action for Children's Television, and we're working to improve what children see on TV. But we can't do it alone. For more information on how you can help, write ACT, Box 510, Boston. It's time you got into the act.
And that's the news for tonight. This is Steve Martin for KYLO. And now, commentary from noted paleontologist, Dr. Gary Yamani. I have found evidence indicating that underground nuclear testing generates a kind of rejuvenating energy. To the layperson, this could be compared to reheating food in a microwave oven. Los Alamos Gila monster was discovered in a dormant state buried along with prehistoric remains some 15 feet below the desert surface. Once removed from the ground, it became quite active. The study of this animal may help answer questions scientists have been asking about prehistoric extinction. This particular species existed some 50 million years ago. By comparison, in the history of the Earth, human existence can be considered to be quite brief, as brief as a single song in your lifetime. I'm Dr. Gary Yamani. This is an historic moment in the history of Los Angeles. The city of Los Angeles is proud to announce we have just completed negotiations with the very reputable firm of Sarazawa Enterprises in a joint venture to build the LA Colossus, an indoor sports stadium seating crowds up to 25,000, a 10 story convention complex. Shopping, hotel, and business center, all intertwined by a 2.5-mile high-speed tubular automotive racetrack, metro systems, people movers, and biospheric landscaping. Overnight, this downtown freeway overpass, recently designated to be replaced by the first structural wonder of the new century, a Los Angeles City joint enterprise with the well-known Japanese entrepreneurial group Sarazawa Enterprises, has suddenly become the center of protest and preservation. The single linchpin in this controversy seems to be one homeless man, one Manzanar Murakami. Here to discuss the issue with me is Mrs. Sally Ogata of the Japanese American Preservation League. Mrs. Ogata. Manzanar Murakami is not a homeless person. He is simply an eccentric man who's always lived in the open. I represent the Japanese American Preservation League whose concern is to look after Japanese Americans which the League has designated under preservation. Yes, but what is Mr. Murakami's connection to this overpass? Why does he refuse to leave? Why don't you ask him that question yourself? The purpose of the League is to make sure that Manzanar Murakami is not harassed and that his civil liberties are protected. Mr. Murakami, what exactly is it you hope to accomplish here? Uh, Dr. Patrick? Dr. Patrick? It's very interesting to find you here, sir. I assume you are overseeing your investment. This is an American venture. It will be totally financed by and for Americans. Every piece of material, from the cement to the steel beams, will be American. And when this place is teeming with American life, it will only be American cars in those driveways. I am American, and this place used to be teeming with American life. Bashing Japan will not make up for the treachery of people like you, and to turn this into a shopping mall is treachery. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we seem to be experiencing an earthquake that the desert landscape is rumbling beneath our feet. We're, oh, God, the, uh, the, there's a, 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 a fissure, a, a, a crack is opening, and the, and the Mother Earth seems to be parting her great lips. The, Mrs. O, no, Mrs. Ogata, where are you going? No, Mrs. Ogata, come back. Mrs. Ogata, you can always buy another plaque. Oh, uh, the, everything around us is in, is in chaos, and there's, oh, but there's, there's something, Something seems to be emerging from the crack. It's a great, it's a, it's green. It's, it's a great green. Oh my God. Oh God, God, God.
And 20 years ago, they pranced around promoting Rainier beer, and now these frolicking beers, well, they're back. Find out where you can see them at 456. You know, if you've uh, lived in, in the uh, Northwest for a while, chances are you remember one of the most successful ad campaigns ever seen here locally. One of my favorites. It had to do with Rainier Beer and some notorious characters called the elusive Rain Beers. Well, they're back. Shauna McLaughlin has that story. It was 1978, and there was just something unforgettable about these two-legged beer bottle stars. They're all awaiting the annual running of the Rainier. The people are, they're, they're, there's something going on behind me. I'm trying to determine what it is. Little did Rainier know their ad campaign would be a runaway hit, much like their runaway characters. Run. One theory is that they are migrating from their high cascades chilling ground. Now, 20 years after that ad campaign struck gold, the Rain Beer are back. And they're here to celebrate Rainier's 20th anniversary. They kicked off the celebration right here on top of the Rainier Brewery. It's a wonderful remembrance of years gone by. It was probably the most well-known advertising in Seattle. And so we're, we thought it would be perfect. It's 20 years later, and here they are. <laughs> The rain beers, thought to be extinct since the early 80s, caused somewhat of a, no pun intended, bottleneck on I-5. And this isn't the last you'll see of this herd. Well, this year we're focusing primarily on radio, outdoor, and uh, the appearances of the rain years. Uh, we're expecting to do TV, be back on TV, which we haven't been on television for some time, next summer. And it's all in an effort to simply bring back some nostalgia and revive some good memories for Rainier beer fans by bringing these beer bottle stars home once again. Right. Shauna McLaughlin, Channel 11 News. Here's something that's kind of cool. Most of those bottles are the original ones. They've been repainted. And uh, we are told that if you'd like to see those rain beers for yourself, they'll be appearing throughout the summer at places like the Bite of Seattle, Emerald Downs, and Westlake Center. Yeah, we were commenting they, they do a very good job dancing with those, with those big giant bottles. You know, yeah. And very impressive. not falling off a roof, you know. <laughs> Ever get frustrated by traffic south of Seattle on I-5, you know, near the Rainier Brewery? Well, today the brewery provided a little comic relief for drivers. <laughs> Yes, the rain beers are back. The two-legged beers danced a few steps on the roof of the brewery today to mark their 20th anniversary. The rain beers gained fame in a 1970s ad campaign for Rainier Beer. Yeah, funny, unless you're in the traffic. I heard it was backed up to, like, Lake City Way today. So for those folks, and, and all the way down on the other side, too, it was that would slow. Be slightly distracting. That, I think, yeah. It would get your attention. Remember the Rainier beer bottles that danced across television screens in the 70s and 80s? Well, the revival of the reveling Rainiers makes our picture of the night. <laughs> Tonight, the bottles performed on the roof of the Rainier factory overlooking I-5. The rain beers are making a comeback for summer, celebrating the anniversary of the ad campaign that launched them into the hearts of beer drinkers and teetotalers alike. <laughs> Like the, the bottles were really stopping traffic. The rain beers were. Probably were. <laughs> <laughs> I'd take a second look. People, well, what am I seeing? <laughs> what would you do if you saw a dancing beer bottle? <laughs> My secretary lives a block from me. Okay. 
And she's in Los Angeles, and I'm in Hollywood. Or I'm okay. in Hollywood, or she's okay. in Los Angeles. So right I don't now. know the difference. Right. You all set? Yeah. We're rolling, and... We're now in Hollywood, California, and we're sitting with one of the uh, most glamorous... Excuse me. Keep your camera rolling. Just re start from the right. beginning. We are now in Hollywood, California, and we are about to visit with one of the most glamorous and certainly one of the best-known Hollywood film personalities, Joan Crawford. Miss Crawford, we want to tell you what a pleasure it is to meet you in person after all these years. Thank you so much, Norma. It's good to see you. Oh, thank you. And I know I'm behalf... I hear you were named after Norma Shearer. That's correct. Right. Norma Shearer and Joan Crawford were my mother's, and, well, you certainly are still my mother's favorite actress. Thank you very much. And you have made, oh, golly, probably just about more pictures than any other woman I can think of, about 80. Is that correct? 80 films? Oh, I think people have made more than that. But that in as a matter, No, as a matter of fact, I went to uh, London uh, 12 years ago to make a picture with Rosanna Brazzi, and uh, they asked me how many pictures I had made, and I said 70-something uh, at that time. And he said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I've made 140. <laughs> <laughs> and he had. Mm -hmm. But uh, pictures made over there that we don't get to see over here, so... But he had made 140. Well, let's say that 80 is quite a tremendous number. And one of the pictures that I saw that I'll never forget you in was Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. What was it like to play opposite Betty Davis in a film of this magnitude? I would think it was the most uh, rewarding experience in the world. As a matter of fact, I put the deal together. Did you really? Oh. I'd wanted to work with her since uh, we were at Warner Brothers together, and uh, I wanted to do Ethan Frome with her. I thought we would be great in mm -hmm. it with uh, Raymond Massey. Oh. Well, you were great in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Well, it was a good <laughs> box office chemistry, I and think. And, of course, many of our viewers will never forget you and Mildred Pierce, the, the great picture that you won the Academy Award for. What is it like with, to be in Hollywood and to win an Academy Award, Ms. Crawford? Can you remember that night when your name was called and you accepted that Academy Award? What was the experience like for you? Did you cry like a lot of these young starlets do now, or did you... Cry? I was home in bed with 104 temperature oh. with my doctor holding me down <laughs> so I wouldn't get to the <laughs> theater to oh. get to it. And the first person who ran into the door was Van Johnson. Oh, well. And then all the cameramen. Mm -hmm. You work some, with some great, great people through the years, Miss Crawford. Is there, um, let's start with actors. Is there one actor that you had the pleasure to know and to work with that you consider the high point in your career? I would think the king. Clark Gable, you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And was he... Was he short? I, I'm tall, so I'm aware of height in men, and, and, and I've heard he's sure. a little bit short, like about 5'8". Clark Gable was 6'3", if he was an inch. Oh, that's great. All right. I'm very happy to hear that. <laughs> and I must tell you another wonderful man. I only had the good fortune to do one picture with him, and that was Spencer Tracy. Mm -hmm. But I did nine with Clark Gable. And then what about actresses that you have revered as friends through the years and as perhaps, in your opinion, good actresses? I think one of the greats were Margaret Sullivan, um, unfortunately no longer with us, but two of the greats who are with us are the two Hepburns. Ah, this is so true. Did you have... Audrey and Catherine. Mm-hmm. I would agree with that. Did you have special training for your voice? You have one of the most beautiful voices that I've ever heard. Thank you, ma'am. I had no special training. You didn't? I just read my scripts out loud and hoped to goodness I could remember the lines and uh, speak <laughs> up. That's all. And she's certainly done this to the pleasure of all of us for many years. We've had the great pleasure of visiting with Joan Crawford. On yet what we're here practically in the shadow of Mount Rainier surrounded by thousands of eager beer aficionados they're all awaiting the annual running of the Rainiers the people are there there's something going on behind me I'm trying to determine what it is we'll try and figure it out for you to get through this crush of people why do the beers run one theory is that they are migrating from their high cascades chilling ground others say the Rainiers are just so fresh and friendly that come spring every 
Sea Galley proudly announces a number one bestseller. Since we started offering a dinner with Alaskan snow crab legs, a hefty slice of prime rib, a baked potato, and our all-you-can-eat salad bar for just $7.99, thousands of you have taken us up on the deal. So by popular demand, we're going to keep on doing it. Come have dinner with us tonight, where we have crab legs and prime rib. For only $7.99, it is truly rapture of the deep, cheap. To be perfectly honest, I've never been that fond of traffic. Mountain fresh and That's my favorite beer. We've got guys from all over the world on our club. Veterans like Edgar Martinez really help them out. I'd like a double tall latte, please. I'd like a double tall latte, please. How about them cooks? How, How about them, them cooks? Gooey duck. Gooey, gooey duck. duck. I took my gooey duck to Puyallup. I, I took my gooey, gooey duck to Puyallup. Good. The Seattle Mariners. You gotta love these guys. Yeah, sure, you betcha.